Hello, I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today and welcome to our Health Matters webinar, Covering Coronavirus, Housing on the Brink. As we gather today to discuss our country's housing crisis during the pandemic, the Biden administration is weighing an extension through at least July for a soon to expire moratorium on evictions for the estimated 10 million families who've fallen behind on their rent across the country. According to the Washington Post, most of the 47 billion in new federal coronavirus relief has yet to reach families most in need. Our nation had a housing crisis before the pandemic. One in four tenants nationwide spent more than half of their income on rent. One million were evicted a year and about half a million people experienced homelessness. But in the midst of an economic crisis precipitated by the pandemic, temporary protections against evictions and foreclosures are only going so far. Mortgage companies and aggressive landlords have found many ways to circumvent protections meant to prevent evictions and home foreclosures. Here to help us explain and explore this urgent topic and provide ideas for reporting on an issue confronting every community in America, we have two distinguished speakers. Catherine O'Regan is a professor of public policy and planning at NYU Wagner and the faculty director of the Master of Science in Public Policy program of the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Planning. She served in the Obama administration as an assistant secretary at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Her research examines the conditions and fortunes of low-income neighborhoods and those who live in them with a focus on racial segregation. We'll also hear from Chris Arnold, a correspondent for NPR. His reports are heard regularly on Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. During the pandemic, he's done extensive reporting on the financial struggles facing millions of people across the country, including moving stories on unethical mortgage companies, misleading homeowners about federal protections, and families threatened with eviction, despite the CDC eviction moratorium. Chris is an award-winning reporter, honored with the 2017 George Foster Peabody Award for his coverage of the Wells Fargo banking scandal, a National Association of Consumer Advocates Award for investigative journalism for a series exposing improper debt collection, a 2016 George Loeb Award for reporting on how Wall Street firms charge retirees excessive fees, and a 2011 Edward R. Murrow Award. We want to thank the Commonwealth Fund, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, and the California Endowment for supporting this program. We also want to express our appreciation for donations to support this programming from individual participants like you. You can tweet about the webinar with the hashtag housing insecurity. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our panelists first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions. Because we have many people participating in this webinar, we'll ask you to write your questions into the Q&A panel of Zoom. You can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems as well. We'll be archiving this webinar later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. Kathy, let's start with you now. Can you share some background on how we got here and the outlines of the housing crisis we're now experiencing. Terrific. Um, yes, that would be great. And I'm hoping you see my slides. Great. Um, the hardest part of this is actually getting the slides to work. So thank you, Michelle and the Center for running um, this, this conversation today. And I'm going to break the foundation into three parts. I'll start with the housing affordability crisis that we had even before COVID. And I'm going to focus a lot there on renters, those who are most immediately at risk, though we'll have a broader conversation. And then I'm going to look at the impact of COVID through the lens of housing, uh, uh, what's going on right now. And I'm going to elevate just a few issues for us to talk about. And at the end, I'm going to talk about the policy levers in some of the federal efforts going on. So I'm going to focus on renters, but in doing that, I I first want to note the pre-existing um, racial disparities and who the renters are in this country. Uh, another way of saying that is the existing and persistent homeownership gaps across race and ethnicity. And so this figure on the left shows that white homeownership is consistently and considerably higher than that for people of color. In fact, the black white racial homeownership gap today is larger than it was in 1960 before the Fair Housing Act. 
And an entire different conversation we could have is the role that discriminatory practices have played in creating and perpetuating those disparities. And in particular, the explicit discrimination codified in federally backed mortgages of the FHA and the practice of redlining, right? Redlining denied mortgages and access to mortgages in black neighborhoods in a way that have undermined the ability of black families to accumulate wealth and have basically created the racially segregated communities that we have. And those policies themselves drive other disparities, access to education, access to healthcare and perpetuate that across generations. So just for today, I wanna note that we're focusing on renters and in the current crisis, 73% of renters in the US are people of color. So in focusing on those renters and the pre-existing crisis, even before COVID, we had a mounting rental affordability crisis that's been driven by increased rents in blue, far outpacing increased growth in incomes, the red line. And this has largely increased this has led to a much larger increase in rent burdens among low-income households. So if we take a look at 1970, 26% of renter households spent more than a third, about more than 30% of their income on rent. That's almost half of households today. And rent burdens are highest among Black and Latinx renters and those with lowest incomes. Why do we care? Uh, because rent burdens bring with them a slew of additional concerns. Front of mind for today's conversation is housing instability. As renters who have thin savings and operate on thin margins are only one small hardship away from a forced move, potentially leading to eviction and homelessness. We know there are a lot of associated costs with that. We have research that show that evictions increase the likelihood of homelessness, greatly increase the use of emergency room services, and negatively affect outcomes for kids. Separate from housing instability, we know that severely cost burdened low income families with children spend almost 100% less on healthcare and 37% less on food than low income families without that burden. And we similarly see these types of disparities but for senior households. So these high rent burdens and associated costs have been now greatly increased by the pandemic. And so I want to look at the effect, the economic effect, not just the health effect, the economic effect of the pandemic on renters and their ability to pay rent. So what do we know? In COVID, we know that renters are particularly vulnerable to the economic impact of COVID, not just from their lower income and their lower savings, but by the occupations they're in. Uh, as of November, 40% of renters had lost jobs or wages due to the pandemic compared to only 30% in homeowners. And as this work by the Urban Institute shows, the impact is particularly among lower income renters who are already facing high rent burdens and are most likely to work in the industries that are impacted. And so this creates the crisis that you were just mentioning, the concern that nearly 10 million uh, renters may be at risk of eviction. And we will talk about the eviction moratorium and its extension. But at best, that's a temporary solution because the debt continues to accumulate. And I want to focus on the on both sides of that concern, the debt that's accruing and, and accumulating for renters and the lost income for landlords. And I'll start on the tenant side. And sadly, there's no national data on real time data on rent payments. But we did some work at the Furman Center looking at affordable housing, 18,000 units in New York City. So housing that serves low-income tenants, but is affordable, so actually may be tenants, low-income tenants who are more protected. And I wanna take a look at that group to see something in particular. I'm gonna use those data to make a couple of points. So this graph shows the share of tenants with rental arrears who, who were already behind in rent in any given month. And the red line is 2019. So you'll see that even before the pandemic, more than half of renters in affordable housing that kind of gives them some protection were behind on rent. And they came into the pandemic behind. The blue line shows what happened in 2020. And right when the economic shutdown in New York came in, you can see a, a spike more being behind 
a couple of months go by when the stimulus checks are coming out and the extended unemployment insurance is there and you can see things improving up until July when the extended benefits stopped and then we see things getting worse. So one thing I take from this is a bit of optimism that the stimulus checks and the enhanced unemployment that are working their way through the system right now may be helping households cover their rent. So what do we know from the landlord side? And where the tenants who aren't able to pay their rent might live. So looking still at New York City, we found that renters in occupations most vulnerable to the jobs and earning losses are living disproportionately in small buildings. It's nearly a third of renters vulnerable to the big economic impacts live in buildings with fewer than five units in New York City. It's much larger than that around the country. And these small landlords are much less equipped to weather long periods of non-payment. Most this housing, the small buildings, also tends to be housing that is more affordable. It's frequently called the naturally occurring affordable housing because it's affordable without government subsidies. And this housing also is more likely to be occupied by people of color. We've also found that rental losses are larger in certain neighborhoods, neighborhoods with pre-existing housing inequality, with the most economically vulnerable households with high rent burdens before. So again, accumulating of impacts on those with the fewest resources to handle them. So we've got crises for a set of renters, for certain landlords who are housing them and the neighborhoods they're located in. So with that as the context, I wanna talk about some of the policy levers that exist and we can talk about in our discussion. Um, Chris is gonna talk a bit about the existing federal protections. So I wanna start by focusing on some of the components in the $1.9 trillion uh, American rescue plan, those that are most relevant for housing. And I would put them in three buckets. The first is a whole set of assistance that is going directly to individuals. So the this is basically cash assistance, right? It's the expanded uh, unemployment benefits and the economic impact payments. This is flexible assistance that goes directly to people fast so they can pay their bills. And I think we're increasingly seeing that a high priority for households is paying their housing bills and that'll help them maintain their housing stability. There's also some additional assistance that covers other um, types of spending such as healthcare and food. And that could free up resources for necessities such as housing. So that's the assistance to housing. Specific to housing, we have a nearly 27 billion in emergency rental assistance and emergency vouchers. So this is assistance that's meant for housing. This is gonna take longer to get to the renters. And one reason for this is that unlike the expanded unemployment insurance where we had a national system that we could expand and build on, as we are doing emergency rental assistance around the country, states and localities have been starting from scratch. They're building entirely new systems in the midst of a pandemic and they're trying to learn as they go. And there's actually been some really heroic effort going on, but a bunch of the money that has already been allocated has not gotten through that system. And there's a real concern both for whether we're gonna get all this money out and who we're gonna miss in the attempts to get it out. I do wanna highlight the last bucket, um, state and local relief. It's a $362 billion going to state and localities for a variety of things. I think this is actually really pretty crucial because it's gonna help protect jurisdictions from cutting their budgets. And during the last several recessions, State and local budgets, when they contract, they really cut their housing programs. And so one benefit of this is we can stop that. The other is state and localities have been really rather strategic in how they use their local money to fill gaps that the federal money can't be used for. And so having more of those resources, is really helpful. I do wanna plug um, something called the Local Housing Solutions, which is a source for other information on policy, housing policy and intervention that can be useful. It's a joint website between the Furman Center and APT. It has a whole collection of policy ideas and examples from around the country. And important here is it has an aspect of part of the site that is dedicated to the COVID responses. It's being updated continuously. And some folks on this call 
might find that useful. So let me just end. The last thing I want to mention are long term, thinking long term. We came into this pandemic with a housing crisis that is not going to go away after the pandemic and that we need to attack. There are a variety of things we need to do in this area, but I want to plug one idea, which is we have long needed something that this crisis has made salient. Maybe now we'll do it, which is a federally funded, locally administered, ongoing emergency rental assistance program. During normal times, this program would help address the type of short-term disruptions in a household circumstances that can lead to eviction or homelessness with all of those additional costs. And much like unemployment insurance, which was originally created during the Great Depression, this program could be scaled up during a local or national crisis. And where we're gonna be at the end of this pandemic, hopefully shortly, um, is that states and localities will have built an infrastructure. We could then use that infrastructure to create a national program so that we will have this in place for the short-term and long-term needs to move upstream and prevent some of the housing instability that we experienced before and certainly during the pandemic. So I will stop with that. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for this really excellent overview. Um, so helpful. We're going to turn now to Chris. You've done some really phenomenal storytelling on uh, some of the weaknesses of government housing protections and how they've worked and not worked. What draws you to these stories and what are your reporting strategies? Chris, we can't hear you. You're muted. Chris, you're, you're muted. It's just showing that you haven't unmuted. I got it, yeah, sorry. When I shared my screen, it moved my control bar across the place, so. Great, uh, we're good now, thank you. Uh, what I was saying was I am now going to attempt to flawlessly segue and answer your question while sharing my screen, uh, which I immediately failed because I had myself muted. So um, we will see if this goes a little better now. All right, so people can hopefully see uh, the, 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 the slides now or we're off to the races. Okay, cool. <laughs> I do interviews over Zoom all the time for stories. I'm often not, I, I'm, I'm better at the front of a room with a clicker. But uh, right, so the types of stories that I am most drawn to as a reporter are those that, you know, that are investigative and, and shine a light on stuff that's not working, right? And, 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 and especially people who don't have a lot of resources and, and, and don't have a lot of ways to, to help themselves. And um, this first slide was, was uh, from a talk I gave before the pandemic uh, to a group of judges up in Maine. Um, I was actually told, oh, you're just gonna go talk to a group of lawyers. A friend of mine said, hey, can you give a talk? And it turned out there were several state Supreme Court judges and uh, uh, federal prosecutors in a room full of very impressive people. So I was glad that I'd prepared for that one. But uh, if anybody has questions later, we can get into some of these other stories. But, but the one here uh, about foreclosures, I spent a lot of time digging into what was going on with foreclosures after the last financial crisis. And um, you know, millions of people lost their homes. I, I, it seems pretty clear to me that half of them didn't need to, that they had incomes that would have allowed them to qualify for you know, for lack of a better word, that, that Obama loan mod program that, that really could have kept so many more people in their homes. The elderly woman here was like 80 years old, legally blind, on disability, should have qualified, and one of the major banks has taken her home from her. And, you know, it, we did a story and it, that didn't happen. But like, you know, I, I had seen so much wreckage around that in the prior crisis that when we hit uh, the pandemic, I thought, all right, uh, that's a natural place to look, you know, what, what's going on with homeowners if people have lost their jobs, uh, what's gonna happen here? And, you know, uh, surprisingly, maybe, uh, it seemed like Congress learned a lot from the previous crisis, that right out of the gate with the CARES Act, um, there were strong protections for, home, for, protections for homeowners. And, uh, and also, um, Kathy was talking about small landlords 
a lot of these extend to small landlords. So if you're doing a story and a small landlord says, look, I got to collect the rent, you could ask, well, what about a mortgage forbearance? Because at the heart of the protections for homeowners, homeowners are allowed to skip mortgage payments for more than a year if, if they have income, an income loss due to COVID. And being a landlord uh, where your tenants can't pay counts. So whether it's a regular homeowner or not, uh, you know, and that's, and then on the back end, you're supposed to have an affordable way to start making the payments again. And the way this is nine times out of 10 supposed to work, if you were making, you pick, you pick a number, $1,000, $2,000 as your monthly mortgage payment, when you get work again, and it's, you know, things have stabilized, you go back to just making that $1,000 or $2,000 mortgage payment, you know, so you're not hit with some crazy repayment plan that doesn't work. The missed payments get shifted to the back end of the loan term. You, you do it for a year. Instead of a 30-year loan, you got a 31-year loan. And it is pretty, it's a pretty artful and impressive uh, way to deal with it. So um, I was very happy to see that. Uh, the only problem with that was that was all on paper. And I did a story about, wow, we've got really strong protections here. And I pretty quickly started getting emails saying like, you know, you got it wrong. You're a bad reporter. My mortgage company is, is being super mean to me. So I jumped on that and found a bunch of people very quickly. It, it turned out, once again, mortgage companies weren't really following the rules. C Congress passed something that was pretty good. Um, and then uh, I started to hear from folks who were saying, yeah, well, when I call my lender, they tell me, uh, you know, uh, it's the conversation is like, yeah, okay, you know, you could skip three or four mortgage payments, but then you're going to owe it all in a giant lump sum payments, you know, like $15,000, $20,000 all at once. You sure you want to do that forbearance? And so then that was scaring homeowners away from getting the help, right? So um, I would reach out like Freedom Mortgage, uh, held the mortgage that the woman uh, on the left there who was in Hawaii and her, her husband is a veteran and you know, nice couple, but the tourism business, they work in the industry, totally disrupted in Hawaii. They don't have jobs. The program was built for them and they're being scared away from getting the help and talking about spending their 401ks. And I call Freedom Mortgage and they say, oh no, we can't offer an affordable option. You know, the law doesn't allow that. And then, so I would just take those emails and forward them on to federal regulators and say, I, you know, am I missing something here? Is, is Freedom Mortgage right? Um, Freedom Mortgage was not right. And, and in those stories actually helped trigger a crackdown by federal regulators to make it very clear, look, these are the rules, issue more guidance, here's what you guys are supposed to be doing in the mortgage industry. So I, I think that's gotten better. Uh, but that's also something going forward we need to keep an eye on because there are um, millions of people still in the forbearance phase that, that are going to come back and need repayment plans. And, and journalists, absolutely, it's a great thing to be keeping an eye on. Are, are, are they being treated fairly or are they getting hit with some payment plan that is nuts and doesn't follow the rules? All right. So homeowners, at least on paper, are we're supposed to be being treated uh, or you know better this time around or, or had stronger protections. Um, what about renters? And as, as I started to look into this, you know, some of the stuff that Kathy was talking about, um, renters have far fewer resources. Uh, uh, one stat, it's a little bit out of date here, but in 2016, Urban Institute says uh, the average net worth of a, a homeowner is $231,000. The average net worth of a renter is far less than that. It's uh, 5,000 bucks. Um, and I think that's the average. If you look at the median, you know, 40% of America doesn't have 400 bucks to fix their car if it breaks, right? And, and meanwhile, the, the average homeowner's got hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. So we've offered really strong protections to homeowners. Renters have far fewer resources. They get nothing, right? I mean, there was nothing in the CARES Act for them. There was no, it was until December, right? I mean, uh, almost a year into the pandemic that Congress finally passed billions of dollars that was specifically targeted for rental assistance. And there was another round of that just recently. That money is only now just flowing, right? So there was no way to skip mortgage payments and have a way to get out of it at the end. You know? So um, that I was very struck by that. Like, okay, there's a huge inequity here and in how we're helping people when it comes to housing during this crisis. 
Um, so I started to look around, all right, how is this playing out? First, courts shut everywhere, everything shut down, a lot of places. As they started to get going again, you know, pretty early on, March and April, um, what was happening? So I started looking at Texas and it wasn't pretty. Um, parts of Texas were, I think this is still happening in, in places around the country, uh, evicting people over Zoom calls. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not safe enough to have a, a hearing where people could go in and talk about something, but apparently it's safe enough to throw people out in the street. Right? So um, I'm just going to play you a little bit of audio or a, a, couple, a minute or two from, from this story. And Pierre's Chris Arnold report. And Pierre's Chris Arnold reports. Oh, and can, you know what? I think I need to hit another button. Could you guys hear that sound? You probably couldn't, or could you? We could hear the sound. Um... Okay, Maybe good. just, yeah. All right. Sorry. The, okay, we're good. And here's Chris Arnold reports. An eviction hearing in Collin County, Texas this week was like many other Zoom calls full of first timers, audio problems, general confusion. Did it freeze? Let me see. Who's got the Galaxy phone? That's the judge who's trying to figure out who's who with a bunch of different people on the call. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking. Can you hear me now? Hello? Uh, wave your hand. Yes. I'm, it would be I'm almost kind of funny, sure. except I'm that what's sure at stake what here is not. Here is not. Renters are in this Zoom hearing with landlords who want to evict them. Renters like Dina Brooks. And Ms. Brooks, any legal reason you're behind your rent? Yes, sir. Um, my company closed um, due to the pandemic. And you had to have a letter from your employer to prove that you were affected by the corona and I was getting the runaround. I haven't been able to get unemployment or anything. The judge said since Brooks lives within the city of Dallas, he wanted to review the current rules on evictions there. So her case got moved to next week. Her landlord declined to comment. We followed up with Dina Brooks after the hearing. She's a Navy veteran and she says she has a heart condition and she says she has no friends or family that she can move in with. And I'm scared. They'll throw everything I have outside on the street. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> it's a nightmare that nobody wants to go through. And a lot of times people don't know what their rights are. Renters may have protections right now, but the rules are complicated and differ from state to county to city. And in the Zoom call hearing, people who did not dial in and their landlord did, they were just out of luck. I'm going to go forward with this one because I, I don't have her here to, to tell me anything. You have a default judgment, possession, back rent, and four costs. Default judgment. That basically means you didn't show up. We're giving your landlord the right to evict you. That happened to five people in just this one Zoom call hearing. So uh, I want you know I, I stopped it there. I, you know that the idea that somebody doesn't get the link to a Zoom call and they lose their housing, right? And, and that happened five times just in this one Zoom call. Uh, you know the, the it, it just is pretty striking. And, and now the CDC order has not been issued yet when this hearing has happened. So uh, in September, the CDC comes out um, and we should say in some places, people were protected from eviction in California and Massachusetts and New York, very strong moratoriums that were effective in other places, no. no. So the CDC comes out nationally uh, with an order and it sounds like, okay, you know, th this, is gonna, this is gonna be like a big national thing. That, that will help a lot of people. And Pierre's uh, So the problem with it was that the, the media also, here's a little uh, media criticism. I, I see a lot of stories where uh, this gets referred to as the CDC eviction ban. It is not a ban. You know, we, we end up calling it the moratorium because it's, it's hard to, exp you know, sometimes you need a tag for something. But I mean, it's Swiss cheese that there are so many loopholes and problems. And if in the question and answer period, I can explain that and not take up so much time. But one big concept is it's not automatic. You know, a, a renter has to know that, all right, to be protected, I have to go to the CDC website. I have to download a form. I got to fill out this stuff. I got to sign under penalty of perjury that I have sought rental assistance, that I've done X, Y, Z, and all these things. Give that to my landlord. And that's supposed to protect me. However, uh, if you, and I think there's like two groups of landlords. But half the landlords seem to be respecting that, maybe more, and and they're waiting till the order is over. You know, um, 
we should say too that the Biden administration is expected to extend it. It expires next week. Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, you know, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but then there's other landlords that just push ahead, and they've got lawyers. They can steamroll past. There's all there's all these loopholes. So uh, the woman in the center of the screen, uh, Tiffany Robinson, I heard from her uh, after she. Well, uh, I'm going to play part of her story. So when she heard about the CDC order, I thought this is going to help. This is going to protect me. So she went to the CDC's website, printed out the right form, signed it and gave it to her landlord. She thought that was supposed to stop an eviction. So she didn't understand why then her landlord told her she had 24 hours to get out. She thought maybe that was a bluff. But she says two men and a woman showed up and they started taking sheets off the beds and then piling them with electronics, lamps, kids paintings. Clothes, shoes, the kids, books, put it in blankets, tie it up like a knapsack and throwing it off the balcony. She says a sheriff's deputy was observing but said there was nothing he could do. Her 12-year-old son was trying to do remote schooling in his bedroom as all this was happening. I shut his bedroom door and told them that room is last. He's doing schoolwork. Don't go in there. Robinson spoke to us from a hotel where she's staying with the kids. And, you know, I, I hope that was loud enough. It sounded a little quiet in my headphones, but try to turn up your, your volume to, to hear it. It's a little weird with the Zoom presentation. But, um, you know, these are families, you know, they have kids and, and it's just, it, it's such an important story because of the high impact on families and the vast number of people involved. Nine and a half million people are late on their rent in America, according to the Census Bureau right now. This eviction order ends in a week. You know, I mean, there's just this fact set is like, oh my God, right? And, and they're good stories to do as journalists because, I mean, you've got real people who need help and are, are struggling, right? And, um, and again, just the impact on kids is something that just hits me again and again. Here's just another quick piece of tape um, from Tiffany's story. It's being treated very differently by different judges around the country. So some people are being evicted even when they thought the order would protect them. You don't have to tell that to Tiffany Robinson in Texas. Her 12-year-old son is still shaken up. He has not wanted to leave my side. Like, not even to go to the bathroom, leave my side. Like, he stands outside the door. So, you know, she also, you know, it puts parents in a rough place too, right? The most important thing is protecting your kids. And then you're, you know, it's traumatic for kids. This haunts them for years. It messes with their heads. And she actually called the FBI and put it on speakerphone and was like, I was treated unfairly. I did the order. I did everything right. And she wanted her kids to hear her like talking to law enforcement saying, I did everything I could to protect my family. Um, and these are just such fundamental issues for people. And, and it's also a fundamental problem with this whole thing is there's been absolutely no enforcement, right? Uh, the other, the woman on the far left, uh, Sheila Ambert, um, she's from Puerto Rico, she's got kids. Uh, you know, she did everything, she's like a poster child. She did the thing right, she got $5,000 of rental assistance for her landlord. And in the court filings, the landlord's lawyer is saying, I should be a little careful how I say this because this is on the record, but you know, uh, things that do not appear to be factual, you know, saying she's done absolutely nothing to comply with the CDC order. Her legal aid attorney says she's done everything. You know, she got the rental assistance. She's done these other things. She's like the poster child of the perfect person who should be protected by the CDC. But, you know, if the person just doesn't show up to the hearing and the lawyer for the landlord saying stuff of questionable veracity, you know, I mean, it, what do you think is going to happen? And, um, and there's been, it seems like there's impunity in terms of um, landlords playing fast and loose with this stuff. So, um, you know, I, I also think uh, like, okay, so talking about where we go from here and, and what happens next, um, I think there are uh, a lot of good stories to do on this moment of crisis we're still in, you know, a, a CDC order gets extended. Is it being enforced? Is that changing? What, what's happening there? Um, I think it's also an opportunity, like Kathy was talking about, um, okay, there's a lot of attention on housing right now, right? Because we're hearing stories about an eviction tsunami that could be looming, you know, uh, and, and, you know, 
another story I'm doing right now is about how, how evictions haunt people for years, right? You get one on your record. It's very hard to find stable housing again because landlords are like, well, this one person's got an eviction on the record. This other one doesn't. Who am I going to rent to as the landlord? And, and you know, it becomes very difficult to find another house. So what one bill introduced in Congress recently is to ex allow people to expunge the uh, that off of their record if it happened during COVID because it was such a hundred year flood type situation. Maybe that goes beyond that. At the state level, there are efforts to allow people to expunge evictions from their record, you know, not related to COVID because, you know, do we really need to have people with this scarlet letter forever and ever and ever, you know, so that these are sort of the stories that are spilling forward after the pandemic that I think could still be good. And, and the one last thing I want to talk about um, before I get the hook here is uh, how do I find people so, to talk to? I get that question a lot. And um, this, okay, so what's worked for us, a lot of the, these social media call-out surveys, we call them, where over here on the, uh, on the left, uh, this is kind of, a, it appears like a story on the website, you know, or a, a smaller thing they click on. Um, have you been evicted during the pandemic or afraid of losing your home? They go there, they read a little thing, we wanna hear from you. And then you can build this very detailed and elaborate survey. Uh, for example, you could say, do you rent or own your home? Depending on how they answer that question, it splits and you get like a different logic tree of, of questions. You know, have, are, you, are you facing eviction? Yes, okay, then you get these questions. Um, and then all that gets slurped into a database where I put something like this out, I could get three, four, 500 responses. And then I can search, all right, who's in danger of eviction? Look in that column, find, you know, what's their story? It's all right there. And it's so much quicker and you can find so many more people than, you know, calling 10 different legal aid offices and they're worried about their clients, you know, privacy and stuff. And they're also just super busy trying to stop everybody from getting evicted. Not that their client's privacy is not important, but this is a much faster path to finding people, you know, and a lot of people don't have a lawyer, right? You call the legal aid office, you're getting the people who are being represented. You know, 95% of people getting evicted are not, you know, they're the stories that we should be telling too, arguably, you know. So um, anyway, so I, I think I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, this also, oh, one more thing about these is try to get them out if you do them. I can talk about the company, the, the ways you can do, you know, set up to do this. Um, you know, try to find a diverse bunch of people too. If we just put it on the NPR website, it's somewhat limited, you know, so I'll post it in eight other places, you know, where you put it in a story that's about the same subject. So as that gets passed around the internet on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else, people see the survey too. Um, and you can get a real range of, uh, of folks uh, who you're looking for. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I've got. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Michelle for, for questions. Thank you so much. Um... I guess I wanted to, to just ask both of you a couple of questions before we open it up to everybody, but also to remind you that you can put your questions for our two panelists in the Q&A uh, panel here. So Chris, um, for a reporter who wants to chronicle this in their local community or in their state and wants to get a sense of the scale of this, tell us a little bit about the data um, that's available and, and it's, uh, you know, what's robust about it and what is weak and, and how you compensate. Yeah, you know, the, the well, the, one good place to start is the eviction lab at Princeton. Uh, they're tracking evictions all around the country. One thing to note, they track eviction filings. So that doesn't mean the person, person's actually been evicted yet. And in one of the loopholes of the CDC thing or issues with it is, is it allows, under the Trump administration, Treasury said, okay, you can file the eviction, you can take like every single step right up to the point of what's called the writ of possession where the landlord gets to seize the house. So it's hard to know like, all right, how many of these people actually got evicted? How many people are just very close to getting evicted? You know, so that it's a little squishy, but at least they have that data. Um, you can also just go, when I find a county that has the civil court records online, you know, that's great because then you can, if you find an individual person, you can go in and get all the documents related to their case. You get the name of the lawyer, you, who's who brought the lawsuit, you get their phone number oftentimes on the court records, their email, you know, you see what the landlord's official name is, a way to contact them. Um, so certainly dig into the court records when, when you're reporting on this stuff. Tracking the numbers, start with the eviction lab and ask them where to go. Oh, and you know, one of the last thing is if you're 
anywhere in the country you're doing this, call a local legal aid office, even if the person you're reporting on is not being represented, because each county is dealing with this so differently, and you want to get it right, you know, and you want to know what's going on there, and it can be a part of the story. Oh, the judges here are just ignoring it. Oh, no, the judges here are, are really taking it seriously, and that's all important for you to know. The little fringe benefit of that is, is often you start asking the legal aid attorneys about this one particular family who's about to be out on the street, and they'll often say, oh, we could represent them. Uh, not that that's technically our job as a journalist, but it ends up helping you as a journalist because if they do represent the person that you're reporting on, you know, you then have the, the confidence that like, okay, you know, that then you have somebody to quote who knows the case and can say, no, the landlord's not following the rules, you know? And so it's uh, for five different reasons, call, call the local legal aid office. Oh, I th you question, muted. question for both of you um, about regional variations in both the laws on the books and the enforcement of these different kinds of protections. Uh, does a reporter in Texas have the same story to tell as one in uh, California or something? No, I, um, the, there are lots of reasons for variation. And I think that Chris has actually been covering stories in those different locations you've got. And so he can add details, you've got state and local laws. So in fact, there is some entire groups of people that are only covered by the CDC moratorium, moratorium and that doesn't cover everybody. And then there are other states and jurisdictions that have collection of, of protections. We also have different uh, economic impacts and populations. And so some populations are more impacted and so that's gonna vary. But something else that we've seen in the rental assistance programs and the use of federal money, we have variation in local capacity of the public agencies and nonprofit ecosystem to get resources out and do things. And so you just, even within a geography around the Bay Area, in looking at what's happening and how things are hitting, you see uh, less dense jurisdictions where they have fewer capacity and resources to get connect people to the rental assistance and you're seeing many more people in trouble. And one more question for both of you and then I'm gonna start pulling in um, some of our audience members. Um, Chris, you, you spoke at the beginning of your presentation about how when you saw the law and you saw these protections that the federal government had got it right in a way it hadn't before. And that even though there were loopholes, um, these protections at least have been put in place. So I'm wondering what are some of the things that this new rescue plan doesn't have in its calculations and where people who are uh, in debt are still not gonna get relief? Just some of the, some of the ways this was all crafted. Yeah, I, I was saying for the homeowner protections, they were super solid. You know, For the renter protections, they were garbage, you know, I mean, it, up until we got to December. I mean, there was nothing for renters, you know, there was no federal moratorium till September, you know, like, I mean, six months of a pandemic and you're just left up to the vagaries of your state or locality, you know, right? So, so just to be clear, I mean, yeah, um, renters, it wasn't good at the beginning. And where there are still problems, I think the CDC order is a big part of that, you know, um, there, housing groups are hoping that the Biden administration will strengthen it, maybe make it automatic, uh, in, at least enforce it, you know? Uh, so that would be one area. Um, I, I think the rental assistance in this latest act that was passed is really encouraging. Uh, landlords and tenants groups are very excited about it. The problem is, you know, you've got uh, it, the portals to apply just open in March in most places. Some they're not even open now. The money's barely starting to flow. You got 10 million people back behind on their rent. It's absolutely impossible that the money's going to reach them before the CDC order expires next week. You know, so it's like it would be nuts if that was allowed to expire. If the goal is to get this housing money to help people, you know. So, um, I think that the hope, I'm gonna pick up right on that last part of, you know, having a, the, the moratoriums extended for a period of time for the resources getting out. So that would be the best case. I mean, that's the scenario that you're hoping for. But I think we also have to have some caution on the ability of getting the assistance out to everybody who needs it. Um, so we've had kind of three rounds. 
There was some rental assistance in the very first round, but it didn't have to be used for rental assistance, but some states and localities began developing systems. And they had a really hard time getting that money out, including people who clearly qualified for the money, not finishing applications because as you heard in the videos, like the documentation is impossible. You can't, you can't find your employer for doing that. Landlords who are afraid to um, be involved in public programs. And so I'm worried that there's even going to be, and some people who don't qualify because of federal requirements, right? So we're missing an entirely set of different non-documented groups, groups who were only working part-time and so didn't qualify for the unemployment insurance. So there's, even with the money getting out, there are going to be some who are lost. And so there's going to be more that's needed, which is one reason I'm glad that there's more than the rental assistance, that we've got the cash assistance and we have other parts of the safety net that might pick up some of the costs to people that we don't do a good enough job on the rental assistance. But I think your first question on, on what it is that you can do federally, this is actually, this was if we had another person on this call, I'd want it to be a lawyer. Um, because if you will remember back to when the CDC moratorium came out, many people didn't think it was legal for the CDC to say, no, you can't kick somebody out of the housing and you have to keep the housing up to habitable standards and the federal government's not gonna give you any money for that. Like there's a thing called takings and I'm not sure on the legal standing, I, I, I want it to hold as long as we need it. But there's a reason I think that it didn't come out as a first tool because we're in totally uncharted territory. Whereas we had a terrible foreclosure crisis by the end of which we had learned a variety of things that were kind of the starting point. And we also have better mechanisms. Forbearance can take your monthly payment and move it to the end of the mortgage and just stream it out a couple of more months or another year. That's 15 years down the line. You can't do that with a one year rental lease. So the getting your head around what the alternative to that is, is has got to be federal resources that cover the debt. It yeah. basically, that's what it has to be. Well, and now we have $50 billion to cover the debt. So we find and that like, it's fun. That's what's so sort of ironic about the CDC order expiring next week. It's like, like people have been, landlords too, have been saying we need the money and the money's finally here and it hasn't even gotten out the door. And now it's like, okay, we're running the eviction more time. So yeah, I mean, you have to think that the administration would extend it just because of the logic there seems so, just doesn't seem to make sense if, you know, um, but, you know, we'll see. Yeah. So we have a question from Lisa Rudman who says, for Kathy especially, I'm looking into the difference in policy approaches to housing insecurity and homelessness in places like San Francisco that have a housing first philosophy versus New York City's get sober or get a job first before housing. So we'll point you to shelters. I don't know if she says broad shorthand here. Could you speak to that again? Uh, I'm sorry, could you speak to that a bit? Please forgive my partial understanding. And thanks for emphasizing racial differential with the history of home loan discrimination and redlining. Um, maybe what you could do, Kathy, in answering this is also just kind of explain to everybody um, the two different approaches that she's yeah. referencing. Um, so, um, and the, in, and I actually think, I think uh, those who are uh, experts in this area around the country have really used the research for something called, to really push housing first, which is recognizing that stabilizing some, a homeless person's housing situation may be a necessary foundation for improvement along other dimensions. And then, and then so housing first actually has been leading um, in most, you know, HUD really pushed this with the research. And I would say New York City believes in that. What New York City has um, that, but you're exactly right, the emphasis on shelter. New York City also has something called right to shelter. And so New York City is responsible for getting homeless people sheltered. And the way of doing that has been homeless shelters. And so that legal requirement has led to quite an investment in the shelter system. And that's not really a housing first model because housing shelters are being increasingly shown as actually being a source of their own trauma. Um, and so I, you know, in the, in the housing world, something that I would say is not the best delivery mechanism in jurisdictions is to have a homelessness service sector distinct from the housing needs so that you funnel money separately when in fact 
homelessness is primarily a housing problem and you would want to actually use your resources differently. So I would say there are advocates in New York City trying to figure out how to rewrite the way that we do this, not because people in New York don't believe in housing first, but we've gone down a path that is not a good delivery mechanism to emphasize housing first, which I think research shows is absolutely the best way to be dealing with um, how homelessness situations. Oh, and just to jump back to the point that Kathy made about the legality of the CDC order, there's this dual, there's this, this is being fought out in the courts right now. You know, there were a bunch of cases that said, yes, the CDC can do this. And now there's some cases that say, no, the CDC can't do this. And, you know, but none of them uh, put an injunction on it. And so it just affects like the one family involved, you know, so it's very, conf no, people don't really know what it means, but we should all be keeping an eye on it, you know, because uh, this could all wind up in a higher court deciding, you know, um, what's legal and what's not. I mean, of course, Congress could just come out and pass, a, you know, something, but they haven't. And then um, we have a question from Neil Morton, who says, I'm an education reporter and housing and urban development's definition of homelessness differs significantly from the U.S. Department of Education McKinney-Vento definition. Is there any indication HUD will use the quote, at risk of homelessness definition to include doubled up and motel families for rental and homeless assistance? Um, so I'm gonna take a crack at this and it was kind of painful to read that. Um, when I was at HUD, I can't tell you how many people have been trying to align those two definitions. And the fact that the definitions are different wreaks havoc on understanding what's going on and funding streams. So um, my optimistic answer would be not that HUD in most of its program and the way that it does things is gonna change any definition, but that on the guidance that gets put out with these rental resources, most of which don't go through HUD, right? Most of the rental assistance is coming through uh, the treasury, but that even for the HUD related, that the guidance does not impose a specific definition. Their entire streams is an entire homelessness um, set of money that does talk about at risk for homeless. And I just, I don't, it, it, almost the best thing would be to not have HUD give a definition and for localities to be able to use the definition that works for their populations. And then we have a question from Jeff Collins who says, California is just starting to roll out 2.6 billion in rental assistance from the December stimulus bill, but only for low income renters earning less than 80% of the median income, which is less than 50% in some jurisdictions. Is that sufficient? And what happens to middle income renters? That's a really good question. Um, and I, uh, the, there was a requirement for the prioritizing and there is that ca uh, income cap. Um, this is a, I don't know that this is how jurisdictions would use it, but the, that, that group in the middle can frequently be the group during a crisis that is uh, very negatively affected. So two things. My understanding is that you are allowed to use the current time period in setting income. So if somebody was at 120% of income and they had a shock, and that's one of the reasons they're in trouble, you can use current income, so what they have in the pandemic when somebody lost their job to qualify them. So uh, it is a much broader group than the typical income limits in the past. And then the other thing is the, the use of state and local resources for gap filling, right? So to the extent that something in the federal definition means there's a population in your jurisdiction that's at big risk, that's where the benefit of the other flexible funding can be particularly important to kind of move it around. Uh, because the the you know the pandemic has gone up the income distribution and, uh, the the scale of who's been affected is quite obviously massive, and it, it brings up an issue though too which we hit on a little bit but the um you know Congress when it passed this stuff I'm a little more familiar with the one from December with rental assistance but it was pretty wide open it was like back twelve months of back rent three months going forward you know. Um, but then the states were allowed to layer on other restrictions and that's gotten like in Texas, they're like, no, three months of back rent. And it's like, well, all right, but what about the landlords who've been being really nice? I had a story on the other day and, and they, a lot, like half of the tenants are, oh, six months of rent, you know? I mean, versus the ones who've been aggressive about evicting people, um, you know, you're kind of hurting the landlords that, that are letting people stay for a long time. You know, they can reapply later, but, and then there's other issues with like, 
they're asking for tax information. And I'm hearing from, from attorneys that like, well, you know, there's a lot of landlords, especially in lower income neighborhoods where you want, where most likely you've got people who need to help really bad. Um, and there's a lot of stuff under the table, right? So, well, if getting this, this money, this rental assistance money means I got to suddenly tell the IRS, you know, like what my actual income is, I'm not interested. And, and they're starting to see that. So, and, and there's 50 other examples, right? So we just, you know, and, and, and that's a good local story too, to see like, okay, what's going on in your area? Where are the bottlenecks? Like call the legal aid offices that are trying to get hook up renters with the landlords and deal with, you know, um, getting the rental assistance money out. And they'll, t if they're big problems, I imagine they're hearing about it and, and they'll tell you what the issue in, in your area is. And then we have a question from Lindsay Holden who says, <clears throat> can one of you share the role renters rights education plays in all of this? These tenant protections are so confusing and I'm sure that plays into the struggles people face in accessing them. Yeah, Chris has probably covered some stories, massive. It's like one of the most important things because it's so confusing. And who are the local groups? In fact, some of the advice that you can give when you wanna give advice to, to households on getting resources that they rely on community-based and local nonprofits who they have um, confidence in. The information is local, plus you wanna know who you're getting it from. Um, so they can play a massive role. And it's one of the things that you could recommend that a jurisdiction be doing, which is to take some of their flexible money and give it to those local community-based organizations that play this information role and that can reach a network of tenants who might not otherwise know anything about their ability to get resources. We have a somewhat technical but interesting question from Linda Seltzer who says, if the 2020 median income drops substantially below the 2019 level, how will this affect HUD rules that base eligibility on the median income. Suddenly thousands of people could lose their eligibility for housing and face eviction only because of this technicality. So maybe in answering it, you all can explain a little bit why these median income measures, what, what they're used for. Yeah. Oh God, this is like- I uh, That was for, for Kathy, for sure. HUD actually calculates AMI. So this is like all my data problems from a previous life. So that's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and so the just at a high level, right? That you know we the the in deciding who um, who it in, by income how somebody qualifies for a program, it's calculated locally to take into account you know cost of living. And so say you have to have income that's below fifty percent of the average in your area to qualify for a lot of housing programs. And so thinking forward of where we are now, when the data gets collected from this time period, incomes are dropping. And does that mean people who currently, when they got into their housing, they qualified, they still qualify now, and their income hasn't gone up, but area median goes down, what's gonna to happen to their qualifications? So it's a very interesting question. There are lots of ways HUD can you provide flexibility in moments of crises. And so one might hope that uh, there'll be flexibility particularly for those with existing housing assistance, that some change in the measure versus their own income comes into play. It also comes into play for setting rents in something called the low-income housing tax credit, another whole other problem. So there's, there's gonna be follow-on. We're in an immediate crisis, and then there's gonna be follow-on through lots of different programs of making sure we don't, as, as sort of Chris was saying and thinking about you had a, an eviction filing that is a very anomalous event for you. And is it gonna be treated by the credit agency and rent and a landlord as though it says something that is only specific to this time. And we're gonna have a whole lot of work that we need to do on exceptions, waivers and alternatives. And I think the expunging is critical, not just for actual evictions, but the filings, just that somebody filed can then prohibit your ability to get housing in the future. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and I, uh legal aid attorney in Alabama I was talking to yesterday, it's like, you know, we, we even get the case dismissed sometimes, but it's still there, you know, and then that landlords don't like it. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think it does seem like there's opportunities. Look, <clears throat> a lot of people are focused on the importance of housing right now. And some of it will be to just expunge records during the COVID thing. 
you know, maybe it goes beyond that. Maybe it starts people, starts a conversation that's bigger, right? You know, that's, uh, I guess I was saying it before, but you know, like how long should this scarlet letter, do I have to wear this on my chest that I got an eviction eight years ago? I'd like to close with the final question to both of you, which is just as we look ahead, as we slowly emerge from this pandemic, what should journalists be looking to? What trends, what, what stories do you see around the, you know, coming up? I'd like to go with an optimistic ending. It has been an amazing year for innovation. Um, it has been led by states and localities for the bulk of this time with not a lot of resources. And um, we've been meeting with cities online to hear about what they need to sort of see if we can be at all useful. I think there's gonna be lessons learned on how to fix a bunch of stuff. So HUD did a whole bunch of waivers because suddenly public housing authorities couldn't go inside buildings and do the inspections and they added flexibilities. What should we fix forward from the things that we learned now? And I think there are just gonna be lots of those that need to be kind of elevated and pay some attention to. Yeah, and I, I think I hit on a lot of mine during, so I don't wanna repeat all of them, but you know, certainly the issue with forbearance is you still got two and a half million people not paying their mortgages. We absolutely have to keep an eye on that going forward. Um, you know, what's gonna happen with all these renters who owe money, you know, and I think cleaning up people's credit is, is gonna be a big issue. Like we were just talking, you know, whether it's an eviction, whether it's you're late on your car payment, whether it's you were paying the utility bill, there's, you know, there's all kinds of people who um, got their credit screwed up, you know, because we had a pandemic and how are we gonna fix all that, you know? And, um, you know, and I think there's some more just sort of cheerful stories, you know, like, uh, We've all been doing Zoom and what does that mean for, you know, it, is that encouraging in some ways for affordable housing and that there's, it's easier to move, move to a rural area now provided that there's bandwidth and not everybody needs to be, you know, right around New York or Silicon Valley or Boston or whatever. And, you know, is that gonna open some stuff up? You know, uh, I think there's, there are lots of interesting stories to be there about what might change in the housing market in general that have affordability you know, aspects to them. Well, I want to thank both of you. This has really been a great overview. Um, it's given people a lot of um, ideas to go forward. And I want to thank our audience for all their wonderful questions. This webinar will be archived a little later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. And um, have a wonderful day.